Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Ole Foundation webinar, Superbugs, Education is the Best Defense, sponsored by Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion Service during HPN Awareness Week. My name is Andrea Guidi and I am the Executive Assistant for the Ole Foundation. I first wanted to mention HPN Awareness Week. For many Ole members, home parental nutrition is part of life. But many people don't know what parental nutrition is, why it is used long term, how it helps, and what struggles and challenges it brings. It brings. HPN Awareness Week is meant to bring some light to these things. It is a chance to share your stories, to build bridges to HPN consumers who aren't yet connected to the community to increase understanding and empathy, to provide hope to others, and an opportunity to talk about the challenges. We hope you will head over to the OLE's Facebook page and watch a video and take part in our discussion. Most of you are probably familiar with the OLE Foundation, but just in case this is your first experience, I'd like to briefly introduce the organization. The OLE Foundation strives to enrich the lives of those living with home nutrition support both intravenous nutrition, sometimes called HPN or TPN, and tube feeding. We do this through education, outreach, and networking. The Ole Foundation was founded in 1983 by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient, Clarence Ole Oldenburg. Today, we serve approximately 25,000 members. All of our programs are free of charge for patients and their families. First, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping details. You should see a toolbar on the right side of your screen. Click on the orange arrow to show the control panel. In the question section, you can type any question you have for me or for the presenter. Please note we will not be responding to the hand raising function in the control panel. We will answer as many questions as possible during the questions and answers period at the end of the presentation. We'll post a recording of the presentation after the webinar on the OLE website. Please note we have muted all of the participants, so you don't need to worry if there's background noise where you're taking this webinar. If you're having technical issues, please go to the Citrix website at the address on your screen. And now for the presentation. This session is designed to provide a general overview on antibiotic resistant organisms, superbugs, in clinical settings, their types, causes, mechanism of action, and impact on patients in hospitals. The steps of mitigation will be discussed to minimize and prevent their propagation, leading to healthcare-acquired infections. If these superbugs are not controlled in a timely fashion, they will continue to have a huge impact on us all, directly and indirectly. Let us all be engaged in the decision-making and right interventions to keep our patients and loved ones safe. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Kamna Gyar Patel. Kamna has a unique and diversified background in nursing and engineering. As a senior director in the innovation department at DSM Biomedical, she provides management oversight to various teams in the areas of project management, process development, material testing, and commercialization of biomaterials for orthopedic, cardiovascular, and reconstructive surgery applications. Previously, the Director of New Product Development at Teleflex's Vascular Division. She was responsible for the development and commercialization of vascular access products such as PICs, CVCs, mechanical thrombectomy device, dialysis catheters, and midline product families. She has a vast experience in the development and commercialization of antimicrobial and antithrombogenic product technologies. Kamna has been an invited speaker at various national and international medical conferences and has published scientific papers in various journals. We are so thankful to have you presenting today, Kamna. And now I will turn the presentation over to you. Andrea, can you hear me, Bell? I can. Are you able to see the screen? I am. Looks great. All right. 
Thank you very much, Andrea, for all your support. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Oli Foundation for this opportunity to present and also to thank you all for attending this webinar. Superbugs, education is the best defense. Let us discover together what this means. The field of infection prevention has been my passion for over the last 10 years and have served in this area either by developing antimicrobial technologies and associated new products or speaking at medical conferences globally to bring more awareness related to it. Over the years, this topic became very personal because passing of my two uncles due to getting antibiotic resistant infections in the hospital. They both went there for other medical treatments, but didn't return home. If this happened to me, it can happen to any of you. So please join me in a fight against this societal issue by creating more awareness about superbugs. They are real and they are here. I only have one disclosure. I work for DSM Biomedical in this in their innovation department, and I will not discuss any off-label use. Another disclaimer I have that I'm not a microbiologist or epidemiologist, so be gentle and ask easy questions at the end of the session. I'm just an engineer trying to develop new products and technologies to fight against these bad guys and sharing awareness about them. My goal for this presentation is not to go deep into the weeds, but provide you with high level view and share with you journal awareness on superbugs, why they are real and detrimental threat to our patients and loved ones. What is our role in protection against them? They are real and they are here. Kamna, I just want to interrupt one second. I am seeing your little control panel. If you just want to hit your orange arrow to minimize that, we'll be able to see your whole. There you go, perfect. All right, thank you. I'm going to cover following topics uh, in my presentation. It's not letting me go to the next one. There you go. When I do that, it doesn't let me uh, use my arrow anymore. Can uh, you see it okay? I can see it okay. Are you able to use your keyboard to advance them? Um, actually, I'm doing that. It's not letting me go to the next slide. Hmm. Okay, it works. All right, sorry okay. about that. That's okay. So I'm going to cover following topics in my presentation, overview on superbug and their impact on patients and societal intervention that can be taken to eliminate and minimize this propagation. If these superbugs are not contained and controlled, it's going to have a huge impact on all of us directly and indirectly. They are real and they are here. I don't have powerful music to go with my slides. Let us make an impact with colorful pictures and explore the unique world of microorganism for a few minutes. Microorganisms can be single cell or multicellular. They can be rod shaped or spherical. We can't see them, but they can live anywhere because of their adaptability in extreme conditions. They can be dangerous because they spread and multiply easily. There are many benefits and uses of microorganisms. They're vital in digestion and recycling. They're used in food, energy, and water treatment. We can't see them, but they live everywhere. 
They are too small for human eyes. They can be 0.2 to 2 microns in width or diameter, and they can be up to 1 to 10 microns in length for the non-spherical species. Modern antibiotics was first discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming and had very positive impact on society. Antibiotics are among the most commonly prescribed drugs used in human medicine. They are powerful drugs that are usually safe and very helpful in fighting infectious diseases. But there are times when antibiotics can actually be harmful. It was already identified early on that bacteria developed antibiotic resistance whenever used too little or for a shorter period. The use of antibiotics is the single most important factor leading to antibiotic resistance around the world. Antibiotics have been used for 70 years and they have helped reduce illness and death from infectious diseases. But their impact is becoming dangerous as more organisms such as bacteria, parasites, fungus, or viruses have adapted to drugs that were designed to kill them, making these drugs less effective. They have developed resistance to single drug or several drugs. They continue to survive and multiply, causing more harm and spreading quickly within general community. First known use of the word superbug was done in 1985. Antibiotic resistance does not mean the body is becoming resistant to antibiotics. It is that bacteria has become resistant to the antibiotics designed to kill them. Survival of the pathogenic organisms that becomes resistant to multi-drugs becomes superbugs, or they are also called MDR, which means multi-drug resistant organism. Superbugs come in different size and shape. Here are some visual examples to share with you all to give you some visual pictorial view of how colorful they can be under microscope. Superbug, why is it a problem? Antimicrobial resistance, which includes antibiotic resistance as a subset is one of our most serious health threats. Each year in the US alone, at least 2.8 million people are infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria or fungi, and more than 35,000 people die. Not acceptable. We cannot completely avoid the risk of resistant infection, but some people are at greater risk than others due to chronic illnesses. If antibiotics lose their effectiveness, then we lose the ability to treat infections. For infection treatment, First-line agent is selected on the basis of several factors, including safety, availability, and cost. Second-line agent is usually broad spectrum, has less favorable risk-benefit profile, and is more expensive or maybe locally unavailable. For these superbugs, first-line antibiotics or second-line antibiotics or third-line antibiotics are not effective so there is no treatment options, or they could be very expensive to treat. They are real, and they are here. Globally, it has been reported that 700,000 people died due to drug resistance strains of common bacterial infections, tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria worldwide annually. It is predicted by Jim O'Neill's surveillance report that by 2050, one person will die every three seconds if this is not tackled now globally. Additionally, per this report, annual infection rate in 2050 will be close to 10 million. If you compare this number to road traffic accident, which is about 1.2 million, diabetes, which is about 1.5 million, and cancer, which is 8.2 million, not acceptable. These superbugs are real and they are here. There is a heavy price of these superbugs. Total economic cost of antibiotic resistance 
to the U.S. economy has been difficult to calculate. The data shows that in U.S., antibiotic-resistant infections have been responsible for every year about $20 billion in excess direct healthcare costs, $35 billion in societal cost due to loss of productivity, and $8 million additional hospital days. As you can see, antibiotic-resistant infection add avoidable costs to the already overburdened U.S. healthcare system. Due to prolonged or costlier treatment, extended hospital stays necessitate additional doctor visits and healthcare use and result in greater disability and death compared with infections that are easily treatable with antibiotics. Superbugs get periodically airtime, like at NBC, CBC, website articles, or headlines in the newspaper. Is this enough to create awareness or we need more? We definitely need more. Here are some headlines that I'd like to share with you. Superbugs on the rise, super resistant superbugs, the rise of the superbug, 23,000 killed by superbug in US each year, CDC says. Beware, this deadly bacteria may be lurking on grocery shelves. Hospitals battles to control superbugs. Superbugs don't respect borders. Superbugs in the news, how COVID-19 is increasing, increasing antibiotic use. Once again, why is it a problem? Just to summarize, superbugs kill people. They can become epidemic because nothing works against it, so have a chance to spread to others. They increase the cost of healthcare. They are potential to threaten health security and damage trade and economics. Antibiotic-resistant infections can happen anywhere. Data show that most happen in the general community. However, most deaths related to antibiotic resistance happen in healthcare settings, such as hospitals and nursing homes. In the past, resistant infections were associated predominantly with hospitals and care settings. But over the last 10 years, resistant infection have been seen in wider communities. Superbook can quickly spread across settings, including communities, the food supply, healthcare facilities, the environment such as soil, water, and around the world. Superbugs have been traveling on boats, ships, aeroplanes. New forms of resistance emerge and can spread with remarkable speed among countries and continents through the hands of people, goods, and animals. Here in US, Centers for Disease Control and Invention called CDC has done a lot of work in this area for years and they have made significant progress. CDC have categorized and ranked superbugs by threat level. Urgent level, which is the worst type, serious and concerning. They did this based upon clinical impact of these superbugs, economic impact, incident rate, tenure projection of incidents, transmissibility, availability of effective antibiotics, and barriers to prevention. Urgent and serial categories requires more monitoring and prevention activities. Again, this is an eye chart. I am not going to read every organism. A good practice because some of these superbugs are very difficult to even pronounce. But this slide is very important. It shows all the listed superbugs in various categories as described at CDC website. CDC has listed 18 threats in total. Five resistant organisms listed under urgent threats, not acceptable. 11 in serious category and two in concerning threats. Three resistant organisms have been put on watch list that have not spread resistance widely in the US, but could become common if we don't monitor and control them in aggressive ways. Among all bacteria resistant problems, gram negative pathogens are particularly worrisome because they are becoming resistant to nearly all drugs needed for treatment. 
The 2013 and 2019 CDC reports do not include viruses such as HIV, influenza, or parasites. To give you an example, Staphylococcus aureus, also known as staph infection, is one of the major resistant pathogens. They are found on the mucous membranes and the human skin of around a third of the population. It is extremely adaptable to antibiotic pressure and it was one of the earliest bacteria in which penicillin resistance was found. Let us talk about the causes of the superbugs. First is man-made. Up to 50% of all the antibiotics prescribed for people are not needed, are not optimally effective as described, such they are given for viral infection. Misuse of an antibiotic results in complete elimination of bacterial infection, which in turn leads to survival of strains of bacteria that have evolved to resist that particular antibiotic. Second reason is the use of subtherapeutic doses in food animals to prevent, control, and treat disease and to promote the growth of food producing animals. The third reason is the lack of effective government control. In some countries, antibiotics are sold without a prescription. Overall, inappropriately prescribed antibiotic is a greater factor in the increasing rates of bacterial resistance rather than non-compliance with antibiotic protocol. Not acceptable. Resistance to antimicrobial is a natural process as mentioned earlier, that has been observed since the first antibiotics were used. Some bacteria are naturally resistant to certain types of antibiotics. The use of antibiotics can increase selective pressure for survival of resistant bacteria and increase mutation rate due to the stress response. Spontaneous or induced genetic mutation is another way resistance can happen. Sometimes enzymatic deactivation of antibiotics can be a cause as well. Acquisition of resistant genes from other bacterial species by horizontal gene transfer via conjugation is also another cause to create next generation of resistant bacteria. Many resistant genes reside on transmissible plasmids, creating transfer to create more resident resistant organisms. And this goes on. Let us talk about the transmission of superbug in particular, which can happen via animals, which includes consumption of contaminated animal products, such as milk, meat, or eggs, or coming in contact with infected environment or infected animals. There is interdependency in this mode. World Health Organization concluded that inappropriate use of antibiotics in animal husbandry is also an underlying factor that contributes to the emergence and spread of antibiotic resistant organisms. They recommend use of antibiotics as growth promoters in animal feeds, which should be prohibited in the absence of risk assessments. FDA has approved antibiotics for use in food producing animals to treat disease in animals that are sick or they are in a controlled disease for a group of animals when some of the animals are sick. They can also be used to prevent disease in animals that are potentially at risk for becoming sick. Other transmission mode is through human contact, which includes interdependency of contaminated hands, contaminated person's skin, and contaminated environmental surfaces. Superbugs can spread from contaminated surface to contaminated hands or vice versa due to lack of hand washing and or crowded places. I'll talk about this more, more in detail in a later slide. This is a very good visual of showing global traveling impact of superbugs by CDC. More than 1 billion people cross international borders each year, which includes 350 million travelers coming to US. A resistant organism can travel 
very quickly to become a threat. As we are seeing and facing due to COVID pandemic currently, something for us to think about. Let us focus more specifically, what does superbug impact has on healthcare? Healthcare associated infection have devastated effects on physical, mental, emotional, and financial health. As mentioned before, they cause billions of dollars in added expenses to the healthcare system. Let us divide what is healthcare associated infection means. It means infection which is not present and without evidence of incubation at the time of a patient admission. Most infection that can clinically be evident after 48 hours of admission. Infection that occur after patient is discharged if organisms were acquired during facility stay. There are four distinct categories under healthcare associated infection. Center line associated blustering infection called CLAPSI, catheter associated urinary tract infection, surgical site infections, and ventilator associated pneumonia. On a given day, about one in 31 hospital patient has at least one healthcare associated infection not acceptable. Many research studies suggest that growing number of HAR caused by pathogens that are outsmarting the antimicrobial drugs typically used to fight them. Superbugs are real and they are here. Superbugs can reside on any surface such as bed rails, faucets, TV remote, side table, door handles, computer keyboards, IV poles, bathroom handles, hands of the visitor or staff, and your hands can become carriers. Antibiotic resistance can affect people at any stage of life and are difficult to treat, so we need to be vigilant in any condition. And as I mentioned before, in many cases, these infections require extended hospital stay, additional follow-up doctor visits, and the use of treatment may be costly. I want to take a few minutes to go into the deeper dive of how the infections are developed. Here is a visual way to show how an infection can develop. Each link of the chain must be connected as shown on this slide. First is the presence of infectious agent, which can be any organism that can cause a disease such as bacteria, virus, or fungus. Then it needs a reservoir, a place where their organism lives and reproduces, such as food, water, toilet seat, elevator buttons, or respiratory secretion. Then it needs a portal of exit, which means a place where the organism leaves this system, such as respiratory tract via your nose, your mouth, intestinal tract, urinary tract, or blood and any other bodily fluids. It needs a mode of transmission, which means by which an organism can transfer from one carrier to another by either human hands or medical equipment. It needs a portal of entry, an opening where an infectious disease enters the host body, such as mucous membrane, surgical site, open wounds, or tubes inserted in body cavities like catheters or feeding tubes. And lastly, it needs a susceptible host, a person who is at risk for developing an infection from the disease. All these steps are required before an infection can happen. So we need to break this link as part of intervention to stop the transmission of infection and superbugs. These superbugs are just waiting and hovering in these units to enter these sick patients. High risk patients are cancer therapy ones due to low a white blood cell count, patients with complex surgery such as bypass, joint replacement, which could be leading to surgical site infection, rheumatoid arthritis, which may impact the immune system of the patient, dialysis for end-stage renal disease, 
which increases the risk for bloodstream infection, organ and bone marrow transplants due to increased risk of infection and weak immune system. The loss of effective antibiotics will undermine our ability to fight infectious diseases in these vulnerable patients against these superbugs. They are real and they are here. Another healthcare impact to the society is related to reimbursement. Reimbursement landscape has been changing and have become more performance-based. As of October 1st, 2008, Medicare has stopped reimbursing for certain types of hospital acquired infections. Many states are requiring mandatory reporting on infection rates at the hospitals. This Affordable Care Act mandates value-based purchasing in the Medicare program and requires payment tied to hospital performance on core measures and hospital consumer assessments of healthcare providers and systems. There is a decreased reimbursement for high readmission rates for particular hospitals. Lastly, there is decreased reimbursement for high rates of health acquired conditions. Overall, the plan is to improve quality of healthcare that can also lower costs for taxpayers and patients. This also requires creation of strategic plans to avoid costly mistakes and readmissions to keep our patients healthy and rewarding quality instead of quantity. Other healthcare impact system due to superbug is the rise in lawsuit filing and related compensation, which could impact the taxpayers as well indirectly. Some patients may consider filing a lawsuit when preventable, where infection occurred due to the negligence or it's causing injury, disability, or death. These lawsuit filing may include reasons such as contaminated instrument usage, share services which were not cleaned properly, caregivers or clinicians not sanitizing between patients, specific superbug warning not properly posted, uncovered infected wounds on untreated open wounds. Um, there have been multi-million dollar settlements given for these healthcare acquired infections by jury based on the evidence for negligence. They have given compensation for medical expenses, loss of wages, emotional pain and suffering, disability, and et cetera. Professional liability is also a serious concern. It is important to note that all related documentation that will be necessary to prove appropriate precautions are taken is important. So as I mentioned, there is legal and financial implication to have superbug around. Therefore, it is crucial we do our utmost on various fronts to control this issue. Now I would like to review the steps for mitigation and prevention for spreading these superbugs. They are real and they are here. Overall, there has been significant progress made nationally and globally, preventing infections and deaths from resistant organisms. Deaths from antibiotic resistant infections in hospital went down 28% from 2012 to 2017 per CDC reporting. This is a very positive progress, but it is still not enough. And we need to continue to do more by bringing awareness and education about superbugs because they are real and they are here. As mentioned before, antibiotic resistance is a worldwide problem. Superbugs can travel on planes or ships across international boundaries and spread between continents with ease. Many forms of resistance spread at remarkable speed. World health leaders have described antibiotic resistant microorganisms as nightmare bacteria that pose a catastrophic threat to people in every country in the world. First key step is to continue to have massive global public awareness and education campaign at individual, departmental, facility, regional, 
national and global level. It is a global problem, so it requires global holistic action and solution. They are real and they are here. At individual level, each of us can do so many steps to minimize the impact of the spread of superbugs or other infections. We need to continue to emphasize simple things, proper cleaning and hand washing, teach family members proper techniques for hand washing, let us break the chain of infection at every opportunity. Let's report non-compliance and training of staff. Let us manage food safely and properly. Let us ensure to take our advice antibiotics only when they are really necessary. And let us ensure to complete a course of antibiotics. Let us buy and ask for meat and poultry raised without antibiotics in your local restaurants and supermarkets. Let's make sure we all get vaccinated, which are an important step to prevent infections. Let us be vigilant when traveling abroad. Know what vaccinations are needed, check health alerts, stick to safe food and drinks, and plan in advance in case you get sick. Various departmentals can do many things to help minimize the infection spread. Whether it's a collaboration between environmental services and infection control departments, while to focus on continued training, which causes of contamination, ways of limit use of disinfectants, let us make sure we establish frequency and cleaning methods at these departments. This also requires setting up multidisciplinary team meetings to review infection control progress and outcomes. Discuss periodically what is working, what's not working. Let us share best practices among various departments. Review implementation plan. Create a room cleaning checklist so it's consistently being done. All staff needs to have easy access of personal protective equipment and hand cleaning stations at any place, at any time, all the time. What can be done at a hospital, urgent care, or nursing home level? A lot can still be done. A lot has been done successfully. It is important to do notification of infected or sick patient or staff and display appropriate visual signage. It is important to have maintenance of high level of hygiene in that facility and ensure regular and routine cleaning of all surfaces by healthcare environmental services. It's important to continue to have facility management investment in cleaning and environmental services. It's very important to set zero goal at these facilities and support that with appropriate program and commitment from leadership. It needs to be backed up with implementation strategy, tracking, prescribing, and resistant patterns. And lastly, and not least, identification of measurable goals, protocols, budgets, staff, awareness and education training, and continuous monitoring and improvement. This is all is important and it requires the commitment of leadership at every facility. At national level, CDC work has done in partnership with state and local public health departments, academia, and healthcare partners. CDC supports most of these activities to maximize efficiency and impact through its antimicrobial resistance solution initiative and leverage investments from successful program. Overall, CDC approach has been detect, respond, prevent, and discover. It has tackled many more effective tracking and prevention of healthcare associated infection, blood foodborne illness, tuberculosis, and gonorrhea. They have set up good lab capacity and offered them to all different state and regional lab through networking and bringing lab expertise and existence in other countries as well. It has increased capacity in state and local health department and many countries for rapid detection and faster response to outbreaks and emerging resistance to contain and control spread. 
More effective tracking and prevention of healthcare associated infection has helped the cause a lot. They have also improved antibiotic use to ensure antibiotics are available and work to protect people from life threatening infections or sepsis. And lastly, innovations and collaboration with academia and healthcare partners has been ongoing to identify and implement new ways to prevent infections and their spread in US and abroad. And the development of new antibiotics and new diagnostic tests for resistant organism for early detections. In 2014, World Health Organization published its first global report on surveillance of antimicrobial resistance with data provided by 114 countries. The approach has been people, health workers, policymakers, and industries. They have continued to promote World Antimicrobial Awareness Week every year in November since 2015. The aim of the week is to increase global awareness of antibiotic resistance, and it has also wanted to promote the current usage of antibiotics across all fields in order to prevent further instances of antibiotic resistance. Superbugs exist in every country. They are real and they are here. World Health Organization is guiding the response to antibiotic resistance by bringing all stakeholders together to agree on and work towards a coordinated response. They are strengthening national stewardship and plans to tackle this. They are generating policy guidance and providing technical support for member states and actively encouraging, just like CDC, for more innovation and research and development to come up with more drugs and more diagnostic tests. Superbugs are big concern for vascular access specialists and infection preventionists and other caretakers. Let us review some specific interventions that can be done in the infusion field via vascular access or to feeding for nutrition for our patients and loved ones. Let's review sources of vascular catheter-related infections. The infection or colonization of organisms can happen either through extraluminal, where it can be accessed during insertion through your hands or contaminated disinfectant, which is most of the time is 45% time. It can happen intraluminally, where you are accessing uh, with the infusase or contaminated catheter hub, which happens 26% of the time. Or it can happen through hematogenous seeding, which means there was an organism in the other part of the body and it has floated and attached itself to this catheter and start colonizing before it became full-blown infection. This slide shows uh, the prevalence of overall pathogens. There are three categories of pathogen which are disease causing, gram positive, gram negative, and fungus. Number one ranking is stop areas and list goes on. Enterococcus, E. coli, uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Candida species, Pseudomonas, Clipsilla, and Enterobacter species. This clearly shows the percentage of pathogenic isolate that have been found in healthcare settings and they are ranked accordingly. But the point I want to make in this slide that even though 80% of them are uh, infection causing, but each of these category has its own superbug in every level, which has been put on the CDC threat list, whether it's a Staphylococcus aureus, which has MRSA, VRE, CRE, uh, MDR, CRE, as you can see, there is a strong connection between that that shows us the superbugs are real and they are here. During vascular catheter insertion, make sure clinician is using the right vascular catheters and they're using the right approach to make sure that we are inadvertently not uh, introducing any infection. So CDC guidelines have proposed to use antimicrobial impregnated products, use of checklists, 
use of central line bundle, which includes hand hygiene, chlorhexidine skin antisepsis, maximal barrier precaution, which includes wearing a cap, mask, sterile gown, and gloves while we are inserting these catheters. Optimal site selection is very important. And lastly, appropriate dressing and care and maintenance. CDC guidelines also propose uh, various layers to minimize vascular catheter-related infection. As I mentioned already again, it is very important to have effective care and maintenance, use of maximum barrier, and proper site prepping, and the use of protective device. As shown earlier, the sources of catheter-related infection needs a protection with antimicrobial technology because that minimizes the colonization of organism because it complements the bundle layers. These technologies are designed to protect area where bundle layers cannot touch, which are subcutaneous tract or interlumen. They are the last layer of defense when the other bundle layers may have been breached, such as lapses in techniques, compliance fatigue, or not implementing evidence-based practices. Various research studies have shown catheters with chlorhexidine-based technologies to be very effective against not only various gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria and fungus, but also superbugs due to its mode of action of being cidal and fast acting. It does not give chance for the pathogens to mutate, and there is no literature that shows that resistance has happened against chlorhexidine as an antimicrobial agent. Therefore, chlorhexidine-based technologies are used in various healthcare products due to its effectiveness. Post-insertion, clinician needs to ensure that they are following the right step, such as to minimize the exposure of organism by continuing to use effective hand hygiene, aseptic techniques for catheter access and manipulation, regular site care and dressing changes, IV administration sets and lure connector changes, maintaining catheter patency and following flushing protocol, remove the catheter if the line is not needed, and if catheter-related infection is suspected, then consider culturing the catheter post-removal. Here are some additional steps that can be taken by caretakers to maintain uh, feeding tube. Some of the examples are NG, OG, and G tubes. Make sure to wash hands prior to using the tubing for infusion or site care management. Make sure to follow site care and tubing maintenance for specified protocol. Check for tube placement for signs of any migration. Make sure to check the skin integrity at the insertion site for any signs of irritation or redness periodically to prevent any infection. Some of the signs of infection to watch out for are potentially redness, foul smelling, discharge, green, thick, or white discharge, swelling around the tube, abscess formation, pain, and fever. Call your healthcare provider if any of the following occur. When you see signs of redness, swelling, and ir irritation at the insertion site, or tubing is getting clogged and you're unable to flush with water. Superbugs are real and they are here. It will take joint efforts from all of us to fight them. Patients, families, clinicians, insurance companies, governments, regulatory agencies, healthcare facilities, we all are responsible to reduce the spread of superbugs and create infection prevention solutions. We need to ask the right questions, develop right products or treatments, follow right procedures for insertion and maintenance, and ask for right global solutions to solve preventable costly threat to the society. Let us all be engaged in right decision-making and right interventions to keep ourselves, our patients, and loved ones safe. Only through concerted commitment focus, messaging, and action will the world ever be able to succeed in reducing this threat. If these superbugs are not controlled, 
in timely fashion, they are and will continue to have huge impact on all of us directly and indirectly. They are real and they are here. Please make sure you break the chain of infection all the time, every time by taking the right steps. We must continue to innovate and scale up effective strategies to prevent infection, stop their spread and save lives. Let us have a super fight against these super bugs by creating awareness and global approach for mitigation strategy. Stay safe and healthy in these unprecedented times. Wishing you all the best. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Kamna, for the excellent presentation. And this brings us to our question and answer session. So if you haven't already done so, feel free to submit your questions in the question section of the toolbar on the right side of your screen. And we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. So Kamna, we have our first question. By All not right. By not approving alternate lock solutions, the FDA promotes antibiotic use in central lines, even though they are ineffective and cause further resistance. How do clinicians and patients get FDA to change their practice and approve locks that fight this battle? I think it, from my perspective, it comes down to, again, uh, generating the data of the effectiveness of these log solutions and continue to have the dialogue with FDA because overall again it becomes a decision about risk versus benefits and it's about educating the system. I have worked with log solutions and it comes down to the medical device companies to be able to uh, test their products in compatibility with these log solution. So my recommendation will be that we need to continue to have that dialogue with FDA, including the clinicians and the medical partners to make sure that indication comes through. Thanks, Kamna. Uh, the next question we have is, the use of sanitizers has increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you think this increased use will affect superbugs? I read a lot of studies related to that, that uh, COVID uh, is having impact potentially and different agencies are reviewing this. But again, I'm gonna respond that, again, it comes down to the risk versus benefit. Till we get more conclusive data, I think it's important to take the right step, which means hand washing. And if there is no accessibility to water, hand sanitizers are the best thing to do um, because there are so many other organisms that could be removed from your effort and you won't be exposing your loved one or your patient. So to me, till we get clear data, I think it's important to continue to use the hand sanitizer if the hand washing is not accessible because it's not only about superbugs, it's about so many more organisms that they do get washed away or killed by these sanitizers. So you're not giving your loved one or your patient something else. Excellent. Uh, we have another question. Some sa staff say, if you have an alcohol cap online, it doesn't need to be cleaned with alcohol swab. What do you think? My recommendation will be that uh, each facilities do have their protocols. So make sure you follow those protocols. And also uh, medical product companies, they also have uh, instruction how to access their product or what kind of a care or maintenance required. So make sure you read their labeling as well to follow that. Um, for me, I when I was taking care of patients, I will always do extra because you never know, but I would highly recommend that you use the indication for use or the labeling for that specific product and you follow your facility protocol as well. Excellent. Uh, we have another one coming in. 
actually we have quite a few coming in. If the central line is infected, it is usually removed or do you keep it and use antibiotic lock? I think it depends upon the product. It depends upon the product because some central lines may be having already coatings on it, different type of a coating. So mm -hmm. I would recommend that you follow the facility procedure or the actual uh, labeling that is associated with that product line to see what's needed to be done because you don't want to have incompatibility issue. Thanks, Kamna. We have, what is drug or antibiotic resistant infection? And can you give an example? Can you repeat that question again, please? What is drug or antibiotic resistant infection? And can you give an example? Uh, I would say antibiotic resistant uh, example is the Staph aureus, uh, because uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, antibiotics are used to fight the bacterial infection. So if in particular infection, the, the type of organism is not effective based upon that antibiotic, then it's called antibiotic resistant. Drug is uh, used more as a overall because uh, in the case of antimicrobial resistant, we have some viruses and parasites where they are not effective against those particular drugs. So that's why, to me, antimicrobial resistance is an overarching and antibiotic resistance is a subset which is more towards bacteria. Thanks, Kamna. The next question we have is, if you just wash your hands thoroughly, should you also hand sanitize prior to accessing central line? Based upon my review and understanding, uh, many studies have shown that proper hand washing and duration is very effective in removing any organisms from your hands and your fingers. So I would not recommend, I don't think it's necessary to also do hand sanitizer. They can be used in all if the hand washing station is not available, but my experience has been that proper hand washing is as effective. And I think that's the best thing to do. Excellent. We have another one coming in. Kamna, do you have some good signs that we can print off or get copies of to post in the hospital rooms when our loved ones are inpatient? I take my own signs I have made and hang them in the room every time my daughter is in the hospital. I'm not aware of anything like that, but I'll take the action item to look into that and I'll let Andrea know that. I, I'm, it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Usually hospital provides those signage. Um, I can look into this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, and we will connect and, and see if we can't find something. Yes. Next question is, what is the solution for antibiotic resistant infection? Can you add a little bit more clarity in that question? What is the solution? I think yeah. it's, it's the whole presentation I gave is about awareness. People need to be aware of it and also prevention because we already have a long list of antibiotic resistance organisms that are causing negative impact. How do we prevent more from becoming resistant? And the third piece is uh, the usage of antibiotics appropriately. And lastly, it's going to be case by case. As I have shown, there are 18 different superbugs, and they may need different type of treatment. In many cases, there is no treatment, and that's why there is a devastating impact on people. But there is no treatment for it, and they are being treated in different ways. And uh, Different pharmaceutical companies are coming up with newer drugs to find solution for that. So that is why it's important for us to have that awareness of and preventions and mitigation 
you do that with education and then rest is going to be based upon what type of infection the patient got. Mm -hmm. We have another question for you. Antibiotics do not penetrate biofilm, which is 80% the cause of CLAPSI. Shouldn't we encourage to not use antibiotic locks as there is no benefit and all risk? I would uh, reframe this question a little bit more differently. Um, in general, biofilm is very difficult to tackle uh, because this is the network of what has been going on with the microorganisms. And it's important that from an infection perspective that we cure colonization. And that's why we mentioned the sources of infection where if you can mitigate or minimize the colonization before it becomes full-blown biofilm is the important thing. Um, I haven't seen any studies that show shows that antibiotics are not effective against biofilm. I have to look into that and get back to you on that. But the way I like to approach is that the key thing is for anyone is that we need to minimize colonization because it's easier to kill one or two or three organisms versus this colony of organization. And finally, when they become biofilm, which is much more challenging to eradicate. Excellent. Uh, it's two o'clock now, but we can take one more question if that's okay with you, Kamna. That's fine. Okay. Uh, do you see a decreased risk in line infections with ethanol lock usage? Many hospitals have studied this, so there is a positive impact with that, uh, but I think it comes down to what that specific product has been cleared for. So it comes down to the FDA requirements from a regulatory perspective but I've seen some hospital studies shown positive impact, but it comes down to the actual catheter. Are they uh, clear to be used with uh, ethanol lock or some other type of lock solutions? Because the key here is that we don't want to infuse certain uh, solution in there and that potentially could impact the mechanical and functional integrity of that catheter. That's why I always like to recommend the user or clinician to always uh, look at the product and see what it has been indicated for because appropriate testing has been done to ensure it stays functional and robust. Excellent. I think that'll be our last question we'll be able to take for today because it looks like we've run out of time. If anyone is looking for more information, please head to the CDC website. There are uh, details on antibiotic and antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we also, um, in reference to the poster that um, an attendee was asking before, Oli does have a Save My Line poster that can be printed off of our website, and that just advises good hand washing, vein preservation, ensures patency, um, and it's free to download off our website, so be sure and, and look there. Um, thank you, Kamna, uh, for a wonderful presentation again, um, and many thanks to Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion Services for supporting this important educational program. Thank you to all our participants for joining us. We'll post a recording of the presentation on the OLE website in case you'd like to view it again. We hope you will join us for another webinar. To view our schedule of upcoming webinars and past webinars, visit the OLE website at oleorg slash webinars. And that's all for today. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Kamna. Thank you, Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion Services. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for listening to me. Appreciate it very much. All the best. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.